they're so much fun. Just crazy. They're so excited right there in that room. Can't hardly even hear them. But I don't have my hearing aids in today. Maybe you can. <laughs> um, anyway, we are working our way through the seven churches of Revelation. The title of the series is Churches of Revelation Reflecting the Light of Christ. Jesus calls all churches in the past, present, and future to reflect the light of Christ in the world. That's our job. We cannot create the light, but we can reflect the light of Jesus that is upon us. So we started looking at these seven churches of Revelation, and the first one we saw in chapter 2 was Ephesus. We saw that Ephesus was a big, busy church, but Jesus said that they had lost their first love. They lost their vision of loving Jesus. The second church we looked at was Smyrna. Smyrna church was a suffering church. They were persecuted, some members even to death. But Jesus provided words of encouragement and comfort to the church in Smyrna. Then we looked at Pergamum. Pergamum, we saw, was a compromised church. They were compromised with the worldly ways that were around them. They allowed the culture to come in to their church. And then Thyatira Church we looked at. We saw that Thyatira Church was a duped church. They allowed some of the members of the church to be a Jezebel, is what the scripture said. And I explained that as a power broker, somebody that was trying to lead the church astray through the power of Satan. They were allowing the schemes of Satan within their church. And then last week we looked at Sardis. The church in Sardis was a monument church. They were clinging on to their past accomplishments and they were missing the opportunity to be on mission for God in the present. Today, we are going to look at Philadelphia Church. And I would call this church a steadfast church. Philadelphia Church is a steadfast church. Next week... We will look at Laodicea, Laodicea Church. And then on March 10th, the following week, we will look at Kenansburg Church. We are going to, I will reveal, reveal the results of the Ministry Insight Tool, the survey that you all participated in. And we're going to reflect on where we are as a church and how we might um, get some information from these seven churches of Revelation for us specifically. Maybe Jesus has been speaking to us all along as we go through these seven churches. And then the following week, on the um, 17th, I will do an overall review of the seven churches of Revelation, and we will also get into chapter 4 of Revelation to wrap up this series, Churches of Revelation reflecting the light of Christ. And you know what the next two Sundays are? Palm Sunday and Easter, right around the corner. So Palm Sunday and Easter, that takes us through the month of March. And then we have um, a new sermon series that'll start in April. And Tiffany is helping put together a, a invitation card that you can use. So I'll introduce that to you when we get it ready um, for you to share with others. For now, let us go to Revelation chapter 3. Revelation chapter 3, starting at verse 7. To the angel of the church in Philadelphia write, These are the words of him who is holy and true, who holds the key of David. What he opens, no one can shut. And what he shuts, no one can open. 
I know your deeds. See, I have placed before you an open door that no one can shut. I know that you have little strength, yet you have kept my word and have not denied my name. I will make those who are of the synagogue of Satan, who claim to be Jews, though they are not, but are liars, I will make them come and fall down at your feet and acknowledge that I have loved you. Since you have kept my command to endure patiently, I will also keep you from the hour of trial that is going to come upon the whole world to test those who live on the earth. I am coming soon. Hold on to what you have so that no one will take your crown. Him who overcomes, I will make a pillar in the temple of my God. Never again will he leave it. I will write on him the name of my God and the name of the city of my God, the new Jerusalem which is coming down out of heaven from my God. And I will also write on him my name. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. The city of Philadelphia. So this is not Philadelphia in in Pennsylvania. This is Philadelphia in the Holy Land where the gospel was being spread by the apostles and churches were being started. That Philadelphia was founded about 150 B.C., so about 150 years before Jesus walked the earth. And it was founded by King Attalus. King Attalus. King Attalus had a nickname. His nickname was Philadelphus, which means lover of a brother. Oh, King Philadelphus. This man was noted for the admiration and love that he had for his brother, Eumenes. Eumenes. Adelus chose to do what was right from the perspective of his brother Eumenes. So he named this small city in honor of his brother Eumenes. Philadelphia, lover of a brother. Too often, I think people assume that Jesus named this church Philadelphia because they exemplified the brotherly love toward Jesus that we all must have. But Philadelphia was already in place where they were located before Jesus was born in the flesh and walked on the earth. So Jesus praises this local church. In verse 8, You take advantage of the open door. You keep my word and have not denied my name. Now we can find a lot of occasions in the New Testament where open door is referred to. So I want to take some time talking about the open door so we all understand what Jesus was saying to this church in Philadelphia and what he is saying to us today. The Apostle Paul used the concept of open doors four times as a metaphor to describe something other than a physical door, something more abstract. What might that be? Here are the scriptures, Acts 14, 27. Acts 14, 27 describes the outcome of Paul's first missionary journey. As though God had opened the door of faith to the Gentiles, is what he wrote in Acts 14, 27. Then we see in 1 Corinthians chapter 16, verse 9, After his next missionary journey, Paul described his work in Ephesus. In 1 Corinthians 16, 9, 
he wrote, a great door for effective work has opened to me. And then in 2 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 12, there was another juncture of Paul's travels as he preached the gospel of Christ. And he said in 2 Corinthians 2, 12, the Lord had opened a door for me. And then in Colossians 4, 3, Colossians 4, 3, while incarcerated in Rome, that's when he wrote Colossians, he requested prayers that God may open a door for our message so that we may proclaim the mystery of Christ. From these four parts of Scripture, we can see that Paul used an open door to describe a special set of circumstances about which we can make some very important observations. Four observations I want to talk about. First, God opened the doors. No person opened the doors by coercion or clever strategies or by force. That's what we tend to want to do. God himself opened these doors on behalf of his kingdom. These were circumstances arranged by the providence of God, not the ingenuity, not the tenacity of people. Some people would call this a coincidence. I like to call these events in my life where God places an open door for his kingdom before me as a God incident. There are no coincidences in life. God is everywhere all the time. There is nothing that we can do, nor there is nothing that the cosmos of the world can do to make these doors open. Only God knows and offers these doors to us. Just like Jesus said in Revelation 3.8, I, he said, have placed before you an open door. Observation number two about open doors. They only opened after Paul had taken some initial action. Paul planned, he traveled, and he engaged in ministry first. Then God opened the doors. You know, oftentimes people tend to wait for doors to open before them before they act not after. They believe that in order to act, open doors will need to show them where to go, what decisions to make, what to do, or which way to go. This can make you and your ministry extremely stagnant. Remember the Great Commission? Jesus said in Matthew 28, go, go make disciples. He didn't say, wait until I open the door. He said, all authority in heaven and earth has been given to me, therefore go. We can learn from the Apostle Paul. He made decisions, and then he acted. Then God would open doors. These doors were open when Paul engaged in ministry and not before. In other words, open doors did not determine Paul's actions, but his actions led to God opening the doors. Though it was God who had opened these doors, he did so sometime after Paul had already made the decision and the choices to perform some type of initial actions of ministry. This is also what is happening in Revelation chapter 3, verse 8. Philadelphia Church was doing ministry. Jesus said, I know your deeds. In other words, they were doing ministry. Then Jesus says, I have placed before you an open door. All right, observation three. The open doors pertain to gospel opportunities. They pertain to gospel opportunities. When Paul spoke, about open doors, he was not referring to opportunities for self-advancement or major personal life decisions. 
He did not look for an open door to find a spouse. He didn't look and wait for an open door to choose his college or to make a career change. The open doors referred to something very specific, opportunities to advance the gospel and to mentor followers of Christ. Paul stepped out on faith, then the doors were open. God had opened the door of faith to the Gentiles, Acts 14, 27. The Lord opened a door to preach Christ's gospel. We saw that in 1 Corinthians and 2 Corinthians. Through prayer, Paul requested an open door to proclaim the mystery of Christ in Colossians. Open doors were very special opportunities that God had arranged for promoting the message of Christ to bring glory to God. Nothing else. Observation number four. The open doors were strategic, but not necessarily favorable. Strategic in God's kingdom, but not necessarily favorable in our world. When we speak about open doors, we usually envision a set of favorable or unusual optimum circumstances that are going to make our life oh so much easier. We like to think that open doors are leading us to smooth sailing through life. Yet the doors that God opened, what he opened to Paul, were not always favorable, not always ideal from our worldly perspective. Though God opened the door of faith to the Gentiles, on Paul's first missionary journey with Barnabas, that trip had some real problems. You should probably read about that later this week. Acts chapter 13 and 14. That's your reading assignment this week, Acts 13 and 14. They met up with a sorcerer, a child of the devil, they were verbally abused by the Jews. They were threatened with persecution and they were ran out of town. Paul was even stoned and left for dead. When Paul requested in prayer that God may open a door for our message so that we may proclaim the mystery of Christ in Colossians chapter 4, verse 3, he was speaking from prison. He did not request an open door to escape from prison. He requested an open door to spread the gospel from within the prison. From these examples, we can see that open doors were special opportunities for, for spreading the gospel message. God placed the open door before Paul after he had taken initial ministry actions. The Apostle Paul did not sit around waiting for gospel opportunities to present themselves. He acted and then looked for God's special intervention along the way. Looking for open doors to advance the gospel rather than advancing his own personal agenda. I'd like to share with you a personal story. A personal story about open doors and Pamela and I. We had an open door opportunity to do ministry and for her to do counseling at a stables in Northwest Indiana. It was owned by a Christian counseling organization. And God opened a door for us to have an opportunity to live on the premises, to manage horse property and animals, and to provide counseling and other ministries. Right up our alley. That's what we did in Texas, and then we were later in the ministry, in the pulpit. So we had that open door, or, sometimes this might happen, or we could continue to walk through the open door of interim pastor ministries. And, Pamela's traditional counseling with mostly online sessions. Either choice, stay with IPM and go to the churches 
where God opened the door for us to go, or go to Northwest Indiana, live the life with these horses, with people that would come for counseling. Either way, we were keeping God's word, and we were not denying the name of Jesus. We had taken some action. God had opened the doors. The doors both open and gave us gospel opportunities. Both options were strategic, but neither would make life easier from a worldly perspective. Really wouldn't have. Live in the trailer or live in the stables. God provided a person in our life that offered very wise counsel. This was very real for us, a very difficult situation. And he learned that the decision we wanted to make was whatever would advance God's kingdom the most, the best, the best we could do. And so he suggested to us that we prayerfully consider which open door would have the greatest kingdom impact. Which would allow us to touch the most lives for God? Revelation chapter 3, verse 8. Jesus says, I know your deeds. He was telling us, I know your desire for ministry. See, he says, I have placed before you an open door that no one can shut. This is between you and me, Jesus says. And for us, two doors were open at the same time, both leading to kingdom effectiveness. And Jesus says, I know that you have little strength, yet you have kept my word and have not denied my name. And so we prayed as that wise counselor provided for us. And you, Cannonsburg Church, are some of the recipients of the open door decision that we made. Because of interim pastor ministries, we can move around and minister to more and more people. Pamela in counseling and me at the church, when we leave for our next location, we will remain a part of you. Better mental health from Pam Pamela's counseling and her down-to-earth caring as a pastor's wife. And strong ministry opportunities for this local church in this community and around the world because of your work and your decisions that you are going to make throughout this interim pastor ministry process. Just think about how many people will be impacted by the kingdom of God over the years at each location that God leads us to. And this is one of those special locations. Jesus tells us, take advantage of the open door, keep his word, and do not deny his name. Now let's look at grievances. That's one of the things we've been looking at for all the churches. And we see that for Philadelphia church, Jesus had no grievance. This church of Philadelphia is one of the unique churches among the seven churches of Revelation, along with Smyrna. Remember, Smyrna was the suffering church, and Jesus had no grievance for them. And here he registers no grievance for the local church of Philadelphia. This church of Philadelphia seems to be a delight to Christ. You know, here's a little bit of information for you. If you read commentaries about the seven churches, if you read from an author that came from the Methodist denomination, it will appear to you as you read about this church in Philadelphia 
that it is of the Wesleyan persuasion. And then, if you pick up another commentary that was written by a Baptist, and you read about Philadelphia Church, it seems like they're talking about First Baptist Church of Philadelphia. Or, if you pick up a commentary written by a Presbyterian, the Presbyterian will describe what was going on in Philadelphia, and it sounds like it was a Presbyterian church. And on, and on, and on. Today, let's just stick to the scriptures, okay? Different Christian denominations did not even exist when these letters were written to the seven churches. We know that Jesus was pleased with the focus of this church because they were focused on his word. And he had no grievances for Philadelphia Church. Now let's look at his counsel. He does provide counsel for the church to remain steadfast. And he gives this to us in two parts. First in verse 10, he says, Endure patiently, the rapture is coming. That's my paraphrase. Before he establishes his kingdom on earth, Jesus will come for his church, an event commonly referred to as the rapture. As the rapture, the dead in Christ will be raised and the living Christians will be caught up to meet the Lord in the sky and to be with him forever and ever. In this resurrection, those who have died in Christ will have their redeemed souls and their spirits united with a body similar to the glorified Jesus in his resurrection body. So they will receive their resurrection body. And us Christians who are living, if he comes before we die, at some future event, we will be changed to be like Christ as we meet him in the air. This expectation is our motivation for holy living to endure patiently, and the promise of the rapture provides a source of comfort. We have a blessed hope. I'm going to go over this in more detail in one of the later scriptures, because it seems like we've been talking a lot about um, Jesus returning, what the rapture is, what the white throne judgment is, or the judgment seat of Christ and I'll try to wrap that all up in one of the sermons within these seven church uh, revelation messages. But I don't really have the time today. So we'll get more information on that coming up. Now, the second part of the council. So the first one was endure patiently because the rapture is coming. The second one is hold on to what you have to maintain your crown. Verse 11. We are instructed to keep a firm grip on the truth and on our loyalty to Jesus. But what is this talk in verse 11 about a crown? You see, the believers in Philadelphia church, they would have been very familiar with marathons, marathon races. To complete a marathon successfully, a runner needed to um, strictly adhere to discipline and abide by the rules of the governing race. And if you won the race, you would receive a crown as your reward. Again, we could look at the Apostle Paul in the New Testament, and if we wanted to, I'm going to refer to 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verses 24 to 26. And if we look at 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verses 24 to 26, Paul provides another good example. He understood that the Christian life is not like a 100-yard dash. Instead, it's like a marathon. Paul demonstrated running the race, running the race patiently. He adhered to a strict discipline, and he kept the rules. He ran to win. And he expected to receive the imperishable crown. The imperishable crown. 
the crown of righteousness. It is a reward that is mentioned in Paul's second letter to Timothy. 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 8. He says this, Now there is in store for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award to me on that day. And not only to me, he says, but also to all y'all, that's us today, who have longed for his appearance. This verse tells us that a crown of righteousness awaits for each one of us. It is in store, meaning it is safely kept for us so that we may receive our crown from our Lord Jesus himself. So back in Revelation chapter 3, verse 11, the counsel is to hold on to the truth and our loyalty to Jesus so that we can receive our reward so that no one will take your crown. As Christians, we wait for the crown that is laid up for us. But in this life, we are currently kings and priests through our connection with Jesus. We wear the crown of authority when we are about the mission of the church. Jesus is the King of kings and the Lord of lords, and he gives us the authority. In Matthew chapter 28, verse 18, because we are Christians, we belong to Jesus and we will receive the crown of righteousness. Jesus has saved us. Jesus has washed our sins away. Jesus has justified us. He has declared us righteous as we stand before God in the righteousness that Christ imputed to each one of us. Hold on to what you have and maintain your crown. Now Jesus rewards those who overcome in two parts in chapter 3. Verse 12, the first part of verse 12, he says, you will be a pillar in the temple. Now Philadelphia, that area where the city of Philadelphia was, was an area troubled with many earthquakes. So they needed to figure out how to build their buildings so they didn't come come falling down during earthquakes. And so the temple was built in Philadelphia where they were worshiping in, with five by five meter, five meter by five meter um, pillars, much wider than what I can reach, five meters. Those pillars could withstand earthquakes. They were immovable. It was the same for us. It is the same for us who overcome. Jesus was telling them, you know those big pillars you, you are building? You will be a pillar in the temple of God. We will be made a pillar in the temple of God. No matter what life sends our way, no matter what trials and temptations we might face, we must never lose our faith. As we remain steadfast in Jesus, we will be able to bear anything but there is more. There is more to it than simply winning a single victory for us to become a pillar. Now, what Scripture says is, to those who overcome, I will make a pillar. This is a process. It means we have to overcome. And then, when we have another trial in life, we need to overcome. And then we need to overcome again. And then we need to overcome again and again. It's a victorious life. Our faithfulness in our trials and our temptations shapes us into a pillar that becomes stronger and stronger day by day. As an overcomer, we will become a pillar in the temple of God. We will become a pillar that can also strengthen and bear and support others' burdens. An overcomer will be a useful tool for God 
And one day, God will be able to say to us, well done, good and faithful servant. Jesus rewards those who overcome. The second part is in verse 12, the second half of verse 12, where he talks about a written name of God, the city of God, and Christ's new name. Names. They reveal ownership and character. Look again at chapter 3, verse 12b. Jesus says, I will write on the one who overcomes the name of my God and the name of the city of my God, the new Jerusalem, which is coming down out of heaven from my God. And I will also write on the one who overcomes my new name. Remember the children's message? Remember those toys, our favorite possessions like, that we like to put our name on? To write one's name upon anything was a common expression to denote taking absolute possession of and making completely one's own. We write our name on possessions that we want to claim as our own. Sometimes we include our address or our phone number so retrieval is made easy. That's what Jesus is doing here. He's writing God's name, his address, the city, and Jesus' new name to make sure that it gets to where it's going. If you are struggling today, you may be encouraged by hearing that a time will come when you will, without any doubt, become God's own. Jesus will write the name of God, the city of God, and Christ's new name on your soul. When you overcome, when you overcome and accept Him as your Lord and Savior. And in addition, in addition to having His name written on you, your new name will be written in the Lamb's book of life. And it can never be removed from there you are no longer able to be claimed by any other whether it be culture or whether it be schemes of the evil one you are safe with Jesus let's go to our Lord in prayer worship team would you please come forward When God puts an open door before you, you can overcome with all heads bowed and all eyes closed. Realize that God is calling you to walk through that door of faith so that you can run the race before you, so that you will be crowned with righteousness. And Jesus will say to you, well done, my good and faithful servant. If you have not accepted Christ yet, you can do it today. Simply believe in your heart and speak it with your lips. I invite you to come forward during this last hymn so that I can pray with you, so that you can share your eternal life with others. If you have accepted Christ, and you've been having a hard time, you're welcome to come forward and just lay your burdens at the foot of the cross. Jesus calls you to come and walk with him. Be an overcomer. Be one of brotherly love and a steadfast church. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
with the statement, and surely I will be with you to the very end of the age. May the peace of God, which passes all understanding, remain with you as you go from here. May you see the open doors that God puts before you so that you can walk through those doors and share the gospel of Jesus Christ. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. Thank you.